the slang dictionary, the vulgar words, street phrases, and fast expressions of high and low society, by John Camden Hotton, narrated by Jack Chikijian. Preface With this work is incorporated the Dictionary of Modern Slang, Cant, and Vulgar Words, issued by a London antiquary in 1859. The first edition of that work contained about 3,000 words. The second, issued 12 months later, gave upwards of 5,000. Both editions were reviewed by the critical press with an approval seldom accorded to small works of the kind. During the four years that have elapsed, the compiler has gone over the field of recognized English once more. The entire subject has been resurveyed, outlying terms and phrases have been brought in, new street words have been added, and better illustrations of old colloquial expressions given. The result is the volume before the reader, which offers for his amusement or instruction nearly 10,000 words and phrases commonly deemed vulgar, but which are used by the highest and lowest, the best, the wisest, as well as the worst and most ignorant of society. Any apology for an inquiry like the present is believed to be unnecessary. The philologist and the historian usually find in such material the best evidences of a people's progress or decline. It may not be out of place to say here, and I am sure he would not have objected, that the late Mr. Buckle took the greatest interest in the subject, and that in a few instances I am indebted to that gentleman for the probable etymologies of some of the terms given in the dictionary. Many of these words and phrases, he used to say, are but serving their apprenticeship, and will eventually become the active strength of our language. The widespread interest taken in the subject of English vulgar speech has surprised me. From almost every capital in Europe I have received communications asking further particulars, or informing me that scraps of their language have become mixed with our street talk. And from India, China, the Cape, Australia, and North and South America, I have received letters of advice or inquiry upon the subject. In German magazines, numerous articles have appeared about my former book, and at Turin, Professor Ascoli has published a lengthy work upon the lingua franca words in the speech of our lower orders, which the Dictionary of Modern Slang was the first to detect and make known. The professor looks to the Lombard merchants who flocked to London in the days of Elizabeth and James I as the source from whence we derive this curious element in our vulgar speech. I'm sorry to inform him that we have to thank the less dignified organ grinders, as they are termed, for the introduction of this Italian peculiarity in our street language. The short history of cant and slang, which precedes the dictionary, was first published in 1859, and has not since been rewritten, although the dictionary which follows has been more than trebled in size, and consequently contains many more illustrations of the different classes of colloquial speech than are given in the introduction. For the general style and aim of this preliminary performance, the compiler feels it necessary to offer some apology. The more vulgar and less known cant or secret terms of the London thieves are included in the dictionary. The compiler scarcely knew what to do with some of the more repulsive of these words, those explanatory of thieving, etc., and which continually occur in the language of low life. Their very existence is a lamentable fact, and the dry, unpoetic way they explain criminal intentions and actions is miserable in the extreme. Crime is an awkward thing to deal with, and as in the case of our own legislature, when trying successfully to regulate the punishment, and at the same time provide for the reformation of criminal offenders, he found the matter a singularly difficult one to manage. Slang is generally pithy and amusing, whereas Kant, like our lower orders in their thoughts and actions, is unrelieved by any feeling approaching to the poetic or the refined. A few slang and Kant words will be observed in the plural, the compiler endeavoured, as far as possible, to give the singular number, but in the case of some of the terms he found this impossible, as he never heard them used in any other form than the plural. 
The reader will please bear in mind that this is a dictionary of modern slang, a list of colloquial words and phrases in present use, whether of ancient or modern formation. Whenever ancient or ancient English is appended to a slang or cant word, it is meant to signify that the expression was in respectable use in or previous to the reign of Queen Elizabeth. Ancient cant indicates that the term was used as a cant word in or previous to the same reign. Old or Old English, affixed to a vulgar word, signifies that it was in general use as a proper expression in or previous to the reign of Charles II. Old cant indicates that the term was in use as a cant word during or before the same reign. Obsolete slang terms are not given. No notice, therefore, has been taken of the numerous expressions that occur in the playbooks and other popular literature of the past three hundred years, which have served their day, and now form no part of our tongue. Only the living language of the time has been dealt with. Not long ago the compiler purchased the history of a Manchester cadger, narrated in his own language, price one penny. He was certainly somewhat surprised on opening the pamphlet to find that it consisted of eight pages of his own little book, reprinted with a few errors, and without any acknowledgment of the source from whence it was taken. He could from his heart recommend the Manchester Cadger reprint the Ten Commandments and study one of them, now that he has somewhat improved his fortune by the first pilfer. It is said that forty thousand copies have been sold of the history. His Imperial Highness the Prince Lucien Bonaparte very recently discovered one of his privately printed little books, The Song of Solomon, in the Lancashire dialect, being hawked around the same city in the form of a two-penny edition. In conclusion, the compiler begs to express his obligations to those correspondents who have from time to time assisted him with their valuable suggestions. J.C.H. Piccadilly, 1st of June, 1864 Preface to the first edition of the Dictionary of Modern Slang, etc. If any gentleman of a studious turn of mind, who may have acquired the habit of carrying pencils and notebooks, would for one year reside in Monmouth Court, Seven Dials, six months in Orchard Street, Westminster, three months in Mint Street, Borough, and consent to undergo another three months on the extremely popular but very much disliked treadmill, commonly the everlasting staircase, Finishing, I will propose, by a six-month's tramp in the character of a cadger and beggar over England, I have not the least doubt but that he would be able to write an interesting work on the languages, secret and vulgar, of the lower orders. In the matter of slang, our studious friend would have to divide his time between observation and research. Conversations on the outsides of omnibuses, on steamboat piers, or at railway termini, would demand his most attentive hearing. So would the knots of semi-decayed cabmen, standing about in bundles of worn-out great coats and hay bands between watering pails, and conversing in a dialect every third word of which is without home or respectable relations. He would also have to station himself for hours near gatherings of ragged boys, playing or fighting but ever and anon contributing to the notebook a pure street term. He would have to hang about lobbies, mark the refined word droppings of magniloquent flunkies, run after all the popular preachers, go to the inns of court, be up all night and about all day, in fact be a ubiquitarian, with a notebook and pencil in hand. As for research, he would have to turn over each page of our popular literature, wander through all the weekly serials, wade through the newspapers, fashionable and unfashionable, and subscribe to Moody's, and scour the novels. This done, and if he has been an observant man, I will engage to say that he has made a choice gathering, and that we may reasonably expect an interesting little book. I give this outline of preparatory study to show the reason the task has never been undertaken before. 
People in the present chase after respectability don't care to turn blackguards and exchange cards with the Whitechapel pecker or the sharp Sally Chicken for the sake of a few vulgar, although curious, words. And we may rest assured that it is quite impossible to write any account of vulgar or low language and remain seated on damask in one's own drawing room. But a fortunate circumstance attended the compiler of the present work, and he has neither been required to reside in Seven Dials, visit the treadmill, nor wander over the country in the character of a vagabond or a cadger. In collecting old ballads, penny histories, and other printed street narratives as materials for a history of cheap or popular literature, he frequently had occasion to purchase in Seven Dials and the Borough a few old songs or dying speeches from the chaunters and patterers who abound in these neighbourhoods. With some of these men, their names would not in the least interest the reader and would only serve the purpose of making this preface look like a vulgar page from the London Directory. An arrangement was made that they should collect the cant and slang words used by the different wandering tribes of London and the country. Some of these chaunters are men of respectable education, although filling a vagabond's calling, and can write good hands, and express themselves fluently, if not with orthographical correctness. To prevent deception and mistakes, the words and phrases sent in were checked off by other chaunters and tramps. Assistance was also sought and obtained through an intelligent printer in Seven Dials from the costermongers in London, and the peddlers and hucksters who traverse the country. In this manner, the greater number of cant words were procured, very valuable help being continually derived from Mayhew's London Labour and the London Poor, a work which had gone over much of the same ground. The slang and vulgar expressions were gleaned from every source which appeared to offer any materials. Indeed, the references attached to words in the dictionary frequently indicate the channels which afforded them. Although in the introduction I have divided cant from slang and treated the subject separately, yet in the dictionary I have only in a few instances pointed out which are slang or which are cant terms. The task would have been a difficult one. Many words which were once cant are slang now. The words prig and cove are instances in point. Once cant and secret terms, they are now only street vulgarisms. The etymologies attempted are only given as contributions to the subject, and the derivation of no vulgar term is guaranteed. The origin of many street words will perhaps never be discovered, having commenced with a knot of illiterate persons and spread amongst a public that cared not a fig for the history of the word, so long as it came to their tongues to give a vulgar piquancy to a joke, or relish to an exceedingly familiar conversation. The references and authorities given frequently show only the direction or probable source of the etymology. The author, to avoid tedious verbiage, was obliged in so small a work to be curt in his notes and suggestions. He has to explain also that a few words will probably be noticed in the slang and cant dictionary that are questionable as coming under either of those designations. These have been admitted because they were originally either vulgar terms or the compiler had something novel to say concerning them. The makers of our large dictionaries have been exceedingly crotchety in their choice of what they considered respectable words. It is amusing to know that Richardson used the word humbug to explain the sense of other words, but omitted it in the alphabetical arrangement as not sufficiently respectable and ancient. The word slang, too, he served in the same way. Filthy and obscene words have been carefully excluded, although street talk, unlicensed and unwritten, abounds in these. As the saying goes, Immodest words admit of no defence, for want of decency is want of sense. It appears from the calculations of philologists that there are 38,000 words in the English language, including derivations. 
I believe I have, for the first time in consecutive order, added at least three thousand words to the previous stock. Vulgar and often very objectionable, but still terms in everyday use, and employed by thousands. It is not generally known that the polite Lord Chesterfield once desired Dr. Johnson to compile a slang dictionary. Indeed, it was Chesterfield, some say, who first used the word humbug. Words, like peculiar styles of dress, get into public favour and come and go in fashion. When great favourites and universal, they truly become household words, although generally considered slang when their origin or antecedents are inquired into. A few errors of the press, I'm sorry to say, may be noticed. But considering the novelty of the subject and the fact that no fixed orthography of vulgar speech exists, it will, I hope, be deemed a not uninteresting essay on a new and very singular branch of human inquiry. For, as Mayhew remarks, the whole subject of cant and slang is, to the philologist, replete with interest of the most profound character. Piccadilly June 30th, 1859 Preface to the second edition of the Dictionary of Modern Slang, etc. The first edition of this work had a rapid sale, and within a few weeks after it was published, the entire issue passed from the publisher's shelves into the hands of the public. A second edition, although urgently called for, was not immediately attempted, the first had been found incomplete and faulty in many respects, and the author determined thoroughly to revise and recast before again going to press. The present edition, therefore, will be found much more complete than the first. Indeed, I may say that it has been entirely rewritten, and that whereas the first contained only three thousand words, this gives nearly five thousand, with a mass of fresh illustrations, and extended articles on the more important slang terms. Humbug, for instance. The notices of a lingua franca element in the language of London vagabonds are peculiar to this edition. My best thanks are due to several correspondents for valuable hints and suggestions as to the probable etymologies of various colloquial expressions. One literary journal of high repute recommended a division of cant from slang but the annoyance of two indices in a small work appeared to me to more than counterbalance the effect of a stricter philological classification. So I have for the present adhered to the old arrangement. Indeed, to separate cant from slang would be almost impossible. Piccadilly, March 15th, 1860 The History of Cant or the secret language of vagabonds. Kant and slang are universal and worldwide. Nearly every nation on the face of the globe, polite and barbarous, may be divided into two portions, the stationary and the wandering, the civilized and the uncivilized, the respectable and the scoundrel, those who have fixed abodes and avail themselves of the refinements of civilization and those who go from place to place picking up a precarious livelihood by petty sales, begging or theft. This peculiarity is to be observed amongst the heathen tribes of the southern hemisphere, as well as in the oldest and most refined countries of Europe. As Mayhew very pertinently remarks, it would appear that not only are all races divisible into wanderers and settlers, but that each civilized or settled tribe has generally some wandering horde intermingled with and in a measure preying upon it. In South Africa, the naked Hottentots are pestered by the Sonquas. And it may be more satisfaction for us to know that our old enemies at the Cape, the Kaffirs, are troubled with a tribe called Fingos. The former term, we are informed by travelers signifying beggars, and the latter wanderers and outcasts. In South America and among the islands of the Pacific, matters are pretty much the same. 
sleek and fat rascals with not much inclination towards honesty, fatten, or rather farsome, like body insects, upon other rascals who would be equally sleek and fat but for their vagabond dependence. Luckily for respectable persons, however, vagabonds both at home and abroad show certain outward peculiarities which distinguish them from a great mass of lawful people of whom they feed and fatten. Personal observation and a little research into books enable me to mark these external traits. The wandering races are remarkable for the development of the bones of the face, as the jaws, cheekbones, etc., high-crowned, stubborn-shaped heads, quick restless eyes, and hands nervously itching to be doing, for their love of gambling, staking their very existence upon a single cast for sensuality of all kinds, and for their use of a cant language with which to conceal their designs and plunderings. The secret jargon or rude speech of the vagabonds who hang upon the Hottentots is termed coos cat. In Finland the fellows who steal seal skins, pick the pockets of bearskin overcoats, and talk cant are termed laps. In France, the secret language of highwaymen, housebreakers, and pickpockets is named Argo. The brigands and the more romantic rascals of Spain term their private tongue Germania, a word probably from the gypsies who were supposed to come from Germany into Spain, or robber's language. Rote Welsh, or foreign beggar talk, is synonymous with cant and thieves talk in Germany. The vulgar dialect of Malta and the Scala towns of the Levant, imported into this country and incorporated with English cant, is known as the lingua franca, or bastard Italian. And the crowds of lazy beggars that infest the streets of Naples and Rome and the brigands that Albert Smith used to describe near Pompeii stopping a railway train and deliberately rifling the pockets and baggage of the passengers, their secret language is termed Jergo. In England, as we all know, it is called cant, often improperly slang. Most nations, then, may boast or rather lament a vulgar tongue, formed principally from the national language, the hereditary property of thieves, tramps, and beggars, the pests of civilized communities. The formation of these secret tongues vary, of course, with the circumstances surrounding the speakers. A writer in Notes and Queries has well remarked that the investigation of the origin and principles of cant and slang language opens a curious field of inquiry, replete with considerable interest to the philologist and the philosopher. It affords a remarkable instance of lingual contrivance which, without the introduction of much arbitrary matter, has developed a system of communicating ideas having all the advantages of a foreign language. An inquiry into the etymology of foreign vulgar secret tongues and their analogy with that spoken in England would be curious and interesting in the extreme. But neither present space nor personal acquirements permit of the task and therefore the writer confines himself to a short account of the origin of English cant. The terms cant and canting were doubtless derived from chant or chanting, the whining tone or modulation of voice adopted by beggars with intent to coax, wheedle, or cajole by pretensions of wretchedness, says Richardson's Dictionary. For the origin of the other application of the word cant, pulpit hypocrisy, we are indebted to a pleasant page in the Spectator, number 147. Cant is by some people derived from one Andrew Cant, who they say was a Presbyterian minister in some illiterate part of Scotland, who by exercise and use had obtained the faculty, alias gift, of talking in the pulpit in such a dialect that it said that he was understood by none but his own congregation, and not by all of them. Since Master Kant's time it has been understood in a larger sense, 
It signifies all exclamations, whinings, unusual tones, and in fine, all praying and preaching like the unlearned of the Presbyterians. This anecdote is curious, if it is not correct. It was the custom in Addison's time to have a fling at the true blue Presbyterians, and the mention made by Whitelock of Andrew Kant, a fanatical Scotch preacher, and the squib upon the same worthy in Scotch Presbyterian eloquence displayed, may probably have started the whimsical etymology. As far as we are concerned, however, in the present inquiry, Kant was derived from chaunt, a beggar's wine, chaunting being the recognized term amongst beggars to this day for begging orations and street whinings, and chaunter, a street talker and tramp, the very term still used by strollers and patterers. The use of the word cant amongst beggars must certainly have commenced at a very early date, for we find to cant to speak in Harmon's list of rogues' words in the year 1566 and Harrison about the same time, in description of England, prefixed to Hollinshed's Chronicle, in speaking of beggars and gypsies, says, they have devised a language among themselves which they name canting, but others peddlers French. Now, the word cant in its old sense, and slang in its modern application, although used by good writers and persons of education as synonyms, are in reality quite distinct and separate terms. Kant, apart from religious hypocrisy, refers to the old secret language by allegory or distinct terms of gypsies, thieves, tramps and beggars. Slang represents that evanescent, vulgar language ever-changing with fashion and taste which has principally come into vogue during the last seventy or eighty years, spoken by persons in every grade of life, rich and poor, honest and dishonest. Kant is old. Slang is always modern and changing. To illustrate the difference, a thief in Kant language would term a horse a prancer or a prad, while in slang a man of fashion would speak of it as a bit of blood or a spanker, or a neat tit. A handkerchief, too, would be a billy, a fogle, or a kent rag, in the secret language of low characters, whilst amongst vulgar persons, or those who aped their speech, it would be called a rag, a wipe, or a clout. Kant was formed for purposes of secrecy. Slang is indulged in from a desire to appear familiar with life, gaiety, town humour, and with the transient nicknames and street jokes of the day. Both cant and slang, I am aware, are often huddled together as synonyms, but they are distinct terms, and as such should be used. To the gypsies, beggars and thieves are undoubtedly indebted for their cant language. The gypsies landed in this country early in the reign of Henry the Eighth. They were at first treated as conjurers and magicians. Indeed, they were hailed by the populace with as much applause as a company of English theatricals usually receive on arriving in a distant colony. They came here with all their old eastern arts of palmistry, fortune-telling, doubling money by incantation and burial, shreds of pagan idolatry, and they brought with them also the dishonesty of the lower caste of Asiatics and the vagabondism they had acquired since leaving their ancient dwelling places in the East many centuries before. They possessed also a language quite distinct from anything that had been heard in England, and they claimed the title of Egyptians, and as such, when their thievish wandering propensities became a public nuisance, were cautioned and prescribed in a royal proclamation by Henry the Eighth. Outlandish people calling themselves Egyptians, he said in 1530. The gypsies were not long in the country before they found native imitators. Vagabondism is peculiarly catching. The idle, the vagrant, and the criminal outcasts of society caught an idea from the so-called Egyptians, soon corrupted to gypsies. They learned from them how to tramp, sleep under hedges and trees, to tell fortunes, 
and find stolen property for a consideration. Frequently, as the saying runs, before it was lost. They also learned the value and application of a secret tongue. Indeed, all the accompaniments of monding and imposture, except thieving and begging, which were well known in this country long before the gypsies paid it a visit, perhaps the only negative good that can be said in their favour. Harmon, in 1566, wrote a singular, not to say droll, book entitled A Caveat for Common Cursitors, vulgarly called Vagabonds, newly augmented and enlarged, wherein the history and various descriptions of rogues and vagabonds are given, together with their canting tongue. This book, the earliest of the kind, gives the singular fact that within a dozen years after the landing of the gypsies, companies of English vagrants were formed, places of meeting appointed, districts for plunder and begging operations marked out, and rules agreed to for their common management. In some cases, gypsies joined the English gangs. In others, English vagrants joined the gypsies. The fellowship was found convenient and profitable, as both parties were aliens to the laws and customs of the country, living in a great measure in the open air, apart from the lawful public, and often meeting each other on the same by-path or on the same retired valley, but seldom intermarrying or entirely adopting each other's habits. The common people, too, soon began to consider them as of one family, all rogues and from Egypt. The secret language spoken by the gypsies, principally Hindu and extremely barbarous to English ears, was found incomprehensible and very difficult to learn. The gypsies also found the same difficulty with the English language. A rude, rough and most singular compromise was made, and a mixture of gypsy, old English, newly coined words, and cribbings from any foreign and therefore secret language, mixed and jumbled together, formed what has ever since been known as the canting language, or peddler's French, or during the past century, St. Giles's Greek. Such was the origin of cant, and in illustration of its blending with the gypsy or singari tongue, dusky and oriental from the sunny plains of Central Asia, I am enabled to give the following list of gypsy and often Hindu words, with in many instances their English adoptions. The modern gypsy bamboozle, to perplex or mislead by hiding, is also bamboozle in English, to delude, cheat or make a fool of anyone. Bosch is gypsy and Persian. Rubbish, nonsense, awful. Bosch in English is stupidity, foolishness. Cheese is gypsy and Hindu, meaning a thing or article, as in that's the cheese or thing. Cheese in English, or cheesy, is a first-rate or very good article. Chive is gypsy for the tongue. Chive in English, or chivey, is a shout or loud-tongued. Kuta is gypsy for a gold coin, whereas Kauter is a sovereign twenty shillings in English. Dade or Dadi in gypsy is a father. Daddy is a nursery term for father in English. In this instance, it is impossible to say whether or not we are indebted to the gypsies for the term. Dad in Welsh also signifies a father. Distarabin in gypsy is a prison. Stirabin in English is a prison. Gad or Gadsy is a wife in gypsy. In English, a female scold, a woman who tramps over the country with a beggar or hawker. Gibberish is the language of gypsies, synonymous with slang. In English, gibberish is rapid and unmeaning speech. Iskur, skur, or kur is a thief in gypsy and Hindu. A cur in English is a mean or dishonest man. Lab is a word in gypsy. In English, lobs are words. Lower or lower is money in gypsy and Wallachian. Lower is money in English. It's ancient cant. 
Mommy, M-A-M-I, is a grandmother in gypsy. Mammy or Mama is a mother in English, formerly sometimes used for grandmother. Mang or Mong is to beg in gypsy and Hindu. Mond is to beg in English. Mort is a free woman, one for common use amongst the male gypsies, so appointed by gypsy custom. In English, Mort or Mot is a prostitute. Moo is the mouth in gypsy and Hindu. Moo or Mun is the mouth in English. Mull is to spoil or destroy in gypsy. It's to spoil or bungle in English. Pal is a brother in gypsy. In English, a partner or relation. Pane is water in gypsy, Hindu and Pawnee. Pani is rain in English. Rig is a performance in gypsy. Rig is a frolic or spree in English. Romany is speech or language in Spanish gypsy. Romany is the gypsy language in English. Rome or Rom is a man in gypsy and Coptic. Rum is a good man or thing in English. In the robber's language of Spain, partly gypsy, rum signifies a harlot. Rami is a woman in gypsy. Rumi is a good woman or girl in English. Slang in gypsy is the language spoken by gypsies. Slang in English is low, vulgar, unauthorized language. Torno means little in gypsy. Tanny or teeny is little in English. And Chib or jib is the tongue in gypsy and Hindu. In English, jib is the tongue. Jabber is quick-tongued or fast talk. And jabber, I am reminded, may be only another form of gabber, gab, very common in Old English from the Anglo-Saxon gaban. Here, then, we have the remarkable fact of several words of pure gypsy and Asiatic origin going the round of Europe, passing into this country before the Reformation, and coming down to us through numerous generations purely in the mouths of the people. They have seldom been written or used in books, and simply as vulgarisms have they reached our time. Only a few are now cant, and some are household words. The word jockey, as applied to a dealer or rider of horses, came from the gypsy, and means in that language a whip. Our standard dictionaries give, of course, none but conjectural etymologies. Another word, bamboozle, has been a sore difficulty with lexicographers. It is not in the old dictionaries, although extensively used in familiar or popular language for the last two centuries. In fact, the very word that Swift, Butler, Lestrange, and Arbuthnot would pick out at once as a telling and most serviceable term. It is, as we have seen, from the gypsy. And here I must state that it was Boucher who first drew attention to the fact, although in his remarks on the dusky tongue he has made a ridiculous mistake by concluding it to be identical with its offspring, Kant. Other parallel instances, with but slight variations from the old gypsy meanings, could be mentioned, but sufficient examples have been adduced to show that Marsden, the great Oriental scholar in the last century, when he declared before the Society of Antiquaries that the cant of English thieves and beggars had nothing to do with the language spoken by the despised gypsies, was in error. Had the gypsy tongue been analysed and committed to writing three centuries ago, there is every probability that many scores of words now in common use could be at once traced to its source. Instances continually occur nowadays of street vulgarisms ascending to the drawing rooms of respectable society. Why then may not the gypsy vagabond alliance three centuries ago have contributed its quota of common words to popular speech? I feel confident there is a gypsy element in the English language, hitherto unrecognised. Slender it may be, but not therefore unimportant. 
Indeed, says Moore, the poet, in a humorous little book, Tom Cribb's Memorial to Congress from 1819, the gypsy language, with the exception of such terms as relate to their own peculiar customs, differs but little from the regular flash or cant language. But this was magnifying the importance of the alliance. Moore knew nothing of the gypsy tongue other than the few cant words put into the mouths of the beggars in Beaumont and Fletcher's Comedy of the Beggar's Bush and Ben Jonson's Mask of the Gypsies Metamorphosed, hence his confounding cant with gypsy speech, and appealing to the glossary of cant for so-called gypsy words at the end of the life of Bamfield Moore Carew to bear him out in his assertion. Still, his remark bears much truth, and proof would have been found long ago if any scholar had taken the trouble to examine the barbarous jargon of Kant and to have compared it with gypsy speech. As George Borrow, in his account of the gypsies in Spain, eloquently concludes his second volume, speaking of the connection of the gypsies with Europeans, saying, Yet from this temporary association were produced two results. European fraud became sharpened by coming into contact with Asiatic craft, whilst European tongues by imperceptible degrees became recruited with various words, some of them wonderfully expressive, many of which have long been stumbling blocks to the philologist, who, whilst stigmatizing them as words of mere vulgar invention, or of unknown origin, has been far from dreaming that a little more research or reflection would have proved their affinity to the Slavonic, Persian, or Romaic, or perhaps to the mysterious object of his veneration, the Sanskrit, the sacred tongue of the palm-covered regions of India, words originally introduced into Europe by objects too miserable to occupy for a moment his lettered attention the despised denizens of the tents of Roma, unquote. But the gypsies, their speech, their character, their history and their religious belief have been totally disregarded, and their poor persons buffeted and jostled about, until it is a wonder that any trace of origin or national speech exists in them. On the continent they received better attention at the hands of learned men. Their language was taken down, their history traced, and their extraordinary customs and practice of living in the open air and eating raw or putrid meat explained. They ate reptiles and told fortunes because they had learnt to do so through their forefathers centuries back in Hindustan, and they devoured carrion because the Hindu proverb, that which God kills is better than that killed by man was still in their remembrance. This very proverb was mentioned by a young gypsy to Crab a few years ago. See Gypsy's Advocate, page 14. Grellmann, a learned German, was their principal historian, and to him we are almost entirely indebted for the little we know of their language. The first European settlement of the gypsies was in the provinces adjoining the Danube, Moldau, and Tais where Mr. Kogal Nichano, in his essay on Sigan from Moldova, Wallachia, estimates them at 200,000. Not a few of our ancient and modern cant and slang terms are Wallachian and Greek words brought in by these wanderers from the East. See Kauter, Drum, Boong, Harmon, Lauer, etc., Gypsy then started and partially merged into Kant, and the old story told by Harrison and others that the first inventor of canting was hanged for his pains would seem to be a fable, for jargon as it is, it was doubtless of gradual formation, like all other languages or systems of speech. The gypsies at the present day all know the old Kant words, as well as their own tongue, or rather what remains of it. As Borrow states, the dialect of the English gypsies is mixed with English words. Those of the tribe who frequent fairs and mix with English tramps readily learn the new words, 
as they are adopted by what Harmon calls the fraternity of vagabonds. Indeed, the old cant is a common language to vagrants of all descriptions and origins scattered over the British Isles. Ancient English cant has considerably altered since the first dictionary was compiled by Harmon in 1566. A great many words are unknown in the present tramps and thieves vernacular. Some of them, however, bear still their old definitions, while others have adopted fresh meanings, to escape detection, I suppose. Abraham, man, is yet seen in our modern sham Abraham, or play the old soldier, that is, to feign sickness or distress. Utem is still a church or chapel amongst gypsies, and Beck, the constable, is our modern cant and slang beak, a policeman or magistrate. Benny or Bonny stands for good in seven dials and the back streets of Westminster, and bowse is our modern booze to drink or fuddle. A bowsing ken was the old cant term for a public house, and boozing ken in modern cant has precisely the same meaning. Boofer was then the term for a dog, now it is buffer, frequently applied to men. Cassan is both old and modern cant for cheese. The same may be said of chats, the gallows. Cove or cove is still the vulgar synonym for a man. Draws was hose or hosen, now applied to the lining for trousers. Dudes was cat for clothes. We now say duds. Flag is still a fourpenny piece, and filch means to rob. Ken is a house, and lick means to thrash. Prancer is yet known amongst rogues as a horse, and to prig amongst high and low is to steal. Three centuries ago, if one beggar said anything disagreeable to another, the person annoyed would say, Stow you, or hold your peace. Low people now say, Stow it, equivalent to be quiet. Treen is still to hang. Win yet stands for a penny, and many other words, as will be seen in the dictionary, still retain their ancient meaning. As specimens of those words which have altered their original cat signification, I may instance cheat. Cheat was in ancient cant what chop is in the Canton Chinese, an almost inseparable adjunct. Everything was termed a cheat and qualified by a substantive adjective which showed what kind of a cheat was meant. For instance, crashing cheats were teeth, a muffling cheat a napkin, a grunting cheat a pig, etc. Cheat nowadays means to defraud or swindle, and lexicographers have tortured etymology for an original, but without success. S. Cheats and S. Cheaters have been named, but with great doubts. Indeed, Stevens, the learned commentator on Shakespeare, acknowledged that he did not recollect to have met with the word cheat in our ancient writers. Cheat, to defraud, then, is no other than an old cant term somewhat altered in its meaning, and as such it should be described in the next etymological dictionary. Another instance of a change in the meaning of the old cant, but the retention of the word, is seen in cly, formerly to take or steal, now a pocket. Remembering a certain class of low characters, the curious connection between the two meanings will be discovered. Make was a halfpenny. We now say mag, make being modern cant for appropriating, convey the wise it call. Milling stood for stealing. It is now a pugilistic term for fighting or beating. Nab was a head. Low people now say knob, the former meaning in modern cant to steal or seize. Peck was meat. We still say peckish when hungry. Prigs, drunken tinkers or beastly people, as old Harmon wrote, would scarcely be understood now. A prig in the nineteenth century is a pickpocket or thief. 
queer, like cheat, was a very common prefix, and meant bad or wicked. It now means odd, curious, or strange. But to the ancient cant we are indebted for the word, which etymologists should remember. Rome, or rum, formerly meant good, or of the first quality, and was extensively used like cheat and queer. Indeed, as an adjective, it was the opposite of the latter. Rum now means curious, and is synonymous with queer, thus a rummy old fellow or a queer old man. Here again we see the origin of an everyday word, scouted by lexicographers and snubbed by respectable persons, but still a word of frequent and popular use. Yanum meant bread. Panum is the word now. Other instances could be pointed out, but they will be observed in the dictionary. Several words are entirely obsolete. Libig no longer means a bed, nor a skew a cup. Boget nowadays would not be understood for a basket. Buget properly signifies a leather wallet, and is probably derived from the low Latin bulga. A tinker's budget is from the same source. Neither would gan pass current for mouth. Fulhams was the old cant term for false or loaded dice, and although used by Shakespeare in this sense, is now unknown and obsolete. Indeed, as Tom Moore somewhere remarks, the present Greeks of St. Giles's themselves would be thoroughly puzzled by many of the ancient canting songs. Taking, for example, this first verse of an old favourite, being out, being morts, and tore, and tore. Being out, being morts, and tore. For all your duds are being de wast, the bean cove hath the lower. Which literally translated means, go out, good girls, and look and see. Go out, good girls, and see. For all your clothes are carried away, and the good man has the money. I think I cannot do better than present to the reader at once an entire copy of the first canting dictionary ever compiled. As before mentioned, it was the work of one Thomas Harmon, a gentleman who lived in the days of Queen Elizabeth. Some writers have remarked that Decker was the first to compile a dictionary of the vagabond's tongue, about the year 1610 whilst Borrow and Thomas More, the poet, stated that Richard Head performed that service in his Life of an English Rogue, published in the year 1680. All these statements are equally incorrect, for the first attempt was made more than a century before the latter work was issued. The quaint spelling and old-fashioned phraseology are preserved, and the reader will quickly detect many vulgar street words, old acquaintances, dressed in antique garb. Abraham men be those that feign themselves to have been mad, and have been kept either in Bethlehem or in some other prison a good time. A libig, a bed, a skew, a cup, utem, a church, utem mortes, married women as chaste as a cow, bawdy baskets, be women who go with baskets and cap cases on their arms wherein they have laces, pins, needles, white inkle, and round silk girdles of all colours. Beck, a constable, today beak. Belly, cheat, apron. Benny, good. Benar, better. Benship, very good. Bleating, cheat. A calf or sheep. Bouguette, a travelling tinker's basket. Board, a shilling. Boong, a purse. The oldest form of this word is in ulfilas, pugs. It exists also in the Greek pong. Today in Frisic it is pong, Wallachian punga. Bows, drink. Bows in ken, an alehouse. Bufa, a dog, today buffer, a man. Bing, a waste, go you hence. Cackling cheat, a cock, or capon. Cassam, cheese, today, cassam. Casters, 
a cloak. Catath, as in the upright coaf Catath to the rogue, probably a shortening or misprint of Cantath. Chats, the gallows. Cheat, see what has been previously said about this word. Cly, to take, receive, or have, a pocket. Coaf, a person. Today, cove. Commission, a shirt. Today, mish. Counterfeit crank. Those that do counterfeit the crank be young knaves and young harlots that deeply dissemble the falling sickness. Crank, falling evil. Cranky, foolish or wasting sickness. Crashing cheats, teeth. Cuffum, a man. Today, a quiff in Northumberland and Scotland signifies a lout or awkward fellow. Darkmans, the night. Dell, a young wench. Dews a veal, the country. Dock, to deflower. Doxes, harlots. Draws, hosem. Dudes, or duds, clothes. Fambles, hands. Fambling cheat, a ring on one's hand. Flag, a groat. Fratter, a beggar with a false paper. Freshwater mariners, this kind of caterpillars counterfeit great losses on the sea. Their ships were drowned in the plain of Salisbury. Filch, to rob. Also, filchman, a robber. Gage, a quart pot. Gan, a mouth. Gentry cof, a noble or gentleman. Gentry cof's ken, a noble or gentleman's house. Gentry mort, a noble or gentlewoman. Jerry, excrement. Glaciers, eyes. Glimmer, fire. Granum, corn. Grunting cheat, a pig. Jib, a writing. Jigger, a door. Hearing cheats, ears. Jark, a seal. Jarkman, one who makes writings and sets seals for counterfeit licenses and passports. Ken, a house. Kinchin Co, or Cove, a young boy trained up like a kinching mort, from the German diminutive Kindchen. Kinching mort, a little girl carried at their mother's back in a slate or sheet who brings them up savagely. Lag. Water. Lag of dudes, a bouquet or basket of clothes. Log, to wash. Lap, butter, milk or whey. Lightmans, the day. Lowing cheat, a cow. Lower, money, from the Wallachian gypsy word lower, coined money. See Kogal Nichano's essay on Sigan from Moldova, Wallachia. Lubbers, as in sturdy lubbers, country bumpkins, or men of a low degree. Libig, a bed. Lick, to beat. Lip, to lie down. Lipken, a house to lie in. Make, a halfpenny, today mag. Marjorie Prater, a hen. Milling, to steal, by sending a child in at a window. Moffling cheat, a napkin. Morts, harlots, today mots. Mill, to rob. Mint, gold. Nab, a head, today knob. Nab cheat, a hat or cap. Nays, drunken. Nogent, a nun. Palyard, a born beggar who counterfeits sickness or incurable sores. They are mostly Welshmen, Harmon says. Param, 
milk. Patrico, a priest. Patrico's kinchen, a pig. A satirical hit at the church. Patrico meaning a parson or priest. And kinchen, his little boy or girl. Peck, meat, as in peckish. Poplars, porridge. Prat, a buttock. Prattling cheat, a tongue. Prancer, a horse. Prigger of prancers, horse stealers, for to prig signifies in their language to steal, and a prancer is a horse, so being put together the matter was plain. Thus writes old Thomas Harmon, who concludes his description of this order of priggers by very quietly saying, I had the best gelding stolen out of my pasture that I had amongst others while this book was first a printing. Prigs, drunken tinkers, or beastly people. Quacking cheat, a drake or duck. Quorums, a body. Queer, bad. See what has been previously said about this word. Queer crampings, bolts or fetters. Queer cuffin, the justice of peace. Queer kin, a prison house. Red shank, a drake or duck. Roger, a goose. Rom, good, now curious, noted or remarkable in any way. Rum is the modern orthography. Rom booze, wine, today rum booze. Rom mort, the queen, Elizabeth. Rom veal, London, or rum veal. Rough peck, bacon, shortbread, common in old times at farmhouses. Ruffmans, the woods or bushes. Solomon, an altar or mass. Skipper, a barn. Slate, a sheet or sheets. Smelling cheat, a nose, also a garden or orchard. Snout fair, said of a woman who has a pretty face or is comely. Stall, to initiate a beggar or rogue into the rights and privileges of the canting order. Harmon relates that when an upright man or initiated first-class rogue met any beggar, whether he be sturdy or impotent, he will demand of him whether ever he was stalled to the rogue or not. If he say he was, he will know of whom and his name that stalled him. And if he be not learnedly able to show him the whole circumstance thereof, he will spoil him of his money, either of his best garment, if it be worth any money, and have him to the bowsing ken, which is to some tippling house next adjoining, and lays there to gauge the best thing that he has for twenty pence or two shillings. This man obeys for fear of beating, and does this upright man call for a gauge of bows, which is a quart pot of drink, and pours the same upon his pelled pate, adding these words, I, G, P, do stall thee, W, T, to the rogue, and that from henceforth it shall be lawful for thee to cant, that is, to ask or beg for thy living in all places. Something like this treatment is the popular idea of Freemasonry, and what schoolboys term freeing. Stamps, legs. Stampers, shoes. Stalling ken a house that will receive stolen wares, also tippling houses. Stow you, hold your peace, also stow it. Strike, to steal. Strommel, straw. Swadder, or peddler, a man who hawks goods. The high pad, the highway. The ruffian cly thee, the devil take thee. Togmans, a cloak, also tog. Togman, a coat. To bows, to drink. To cant, to speak. To cly the jerk, to be whipped. To couch a hog's head, to lie down and sleep. To cut, to say, 
cut it, cut it short, etc., are modern slang phrases. To cut Benny wids, to speak or give good words. To cut queer wids, to give evil words or evil language. To cut Benly, to speak gentle. To dup your jigger, to open the door. To filch, to rob. To hew a bow, to rob or rifle a boweth, a booth. To mond, to ask or require. To mill a ken, to rob a house. To niggle, coition. To nip a boong, to cut a purse. Nip is to steal. To scour the cramp rings, to wear bolts or fetters. To stall, to make or ordain. To the ruffian, to the devil. To tore, to see. Trining, hanging. Tib of the buttery, a goose. Walking mort, women, women who pass for widows. Wapping, coition. Wids, words. Win, a penny. A correspondent of notes and queries suggests the connection of this word with the Welsh gwyn, white, that is, the white silver penny. See other examples under blunt in the dictionary. See also the Armorican gwenic, a penny. And yanam, bread. Turning our attention more to the cant of modern times, in connection with the old, we find that words have been drawn into the thieves' vocabulary from every conceivable source. Hard or infrequent words, vulgarly termed crackjaw or jawbreakers, were very often used and considered as cant terms. And here it should be mentioned that at the present day, the most inconsistent and far-fetched terms are often used for secret purposes, when they are known to be caviar to the million. It is really laughable to know that such words as incongruous, insipid, interloper, intriguing, indecorum, forestall, equip, hush, grapple, etc., were current cant words a century and a half ago. But such was the case, as anyone may see in the dictionary of canting words, at the end of Bacchus and Venus, from 1737. This is a curious volume, and is worth from one to two guineas. The Canting Dictionary was afterwards reprinted word for word with the title of The Scoundrel's Dictionary in 1751. It was originally published without date about the year 1710 by B.E. under the title of A Dictionary of the Canting Crew. These words are inserted not as jokes or squibs, but as selections from the veritable pocket dictionaries of the Jack Shepherds and Dick Turpins of the day. If they were safely used as unknown and cabalistic terms amongst the commonalty, the fact would form a very curious illustration of the ignorance of our poor ancestors. One piece of information is conveyed to us, that is, that the knights or gentlemen of the road, using these polite words in those days of highwaymen, were really well-educated men, which heretofore has always been a hard point of belief, notwithstanding old novels and operas. Amongst those cant words which have either altered their meaning or have become extinct, I may cite Lady, formerly the cant for a very crooked, deformed and ill-shapen woman and Harmon, a pair of stocks, or a constable. The former is a pleasant piece of satire, whilst the latter indicates a singular method of revenge. Harmon was the first author who specially wrote against English vagabonds, and for his trouble his name became synonymous with a pair of stocks, or a policeman of the olden time. Apart from the gypsy element, we find that cant abounds in terms from foreign languages, and that it exhibits the growth of most recognized and completely formed tongues, the gathering of words from foreign sources. 
In the reign of Elizabeth and of King James I, several Dutch, Spanish, and Flemish words were introduced by soldiers who had served in the Low Countries, and sailors who had returned from the Spanish Main, who, like mine ancient pistol, were fond of garnishing their speech with outlandish phrases. Many of these were soon picked up and adopted by vagabonds and tramps in their cant language. The Anglo-Norman and the Anglo-Saxon, the Scotch, the French, the Italian, and even the classic languages of ancient Italy and Greece have contributed to its list of words, besides the various provincial dialects of England. Indeed, as Mayhew remarks, English cant seems to be formed on the same basis as the argot of the French and the rote sprake of the Germans partly metaphorical and partly by the introduction of such corrupted foreign terms as are likely to be unknown to the society amid which the cant speakers exist. Argo is the London thieves' word for their secret language. It is, of course, from the French, but that matters not so long as it is incomprehensible to the police and the mob. Boos or bows, I am reminded by a friendly correspondent, comes from the Dutch boysen. Domine, a parson, is from the Spanish. Donna and Feliz, a woman and children, is from the Latin. And Don, a clever fellow, has been filched from the lingua franca, or bastard Italian, although it sounds like an odd mixture of Spanish and French. Whilst duds, the vulgar term for clothes, may have been pilfered either from the Gaelic or the Dutch. Fili, a daughter, is from the French and Frau, a girl or a wife, from the German, are common tramps' terms. So are gent, silver, from the French, argent, and vial or ville, a country town, also from the French. Horrid horn, a fool, is believed to be from the heirs, and gloak, a man, from the Scotch. As stated before, the dictionary will supply numerous other instances. The Celtic languages have contributed many cant and vulgar words to our popular vocabulary. These have come to us through the Gaelic or Irish languages, so closely allied in their material as to be merely dialects of a primitive, common tongue. This element may be from the Celtic population, which from its ancient position as slaves or servants to the Anglo-Saxon conquerors, has contributed so largely to the lowest class of our population and therefore to our slang, provincial or colloquial words. Or it may be an importation from Irish immigrants, who have undoubtedly contributed very largely to our criminal population. There is one source, however, of secret street terms, which in the first edition of this work was entirely overlooked. Indeed, it was unknown to the editor until pointed out by a friendly correspondent. The lingua franca, or bastard Italian, spoken at Genoa, Trieste, Malta, Constantinople, Smyrna, Alexandria, and all Mediterranean seaport towns. The ingredients of this imported cant are many. Its foundation is Italian, with a mixture of modern Greek, German, from the Austrian ports, Spanish, Turkish, and French. It has been introduced to the notice of the London wandering tribes by the sailors, foreign and English, who trade to and from the Mediterranean seaports, by the swarms of organ players from all parts of Italy, and by the makers of images from Rome and Florence, all of whom in dense thoroughfares mingle with our lower orders. It would occupy too much space here to give a list of these words. They are all noted in the dictionary. Mayhew's London Labour and the London Poor of 1851 states, There are several Hebrew terms in our cant language, obtained, it would appear, from the intercourse of the thieves with the Jew fences, receivers of stolen goods. Many of the cant terms, again, are Sanskrit, got from the gypsies, many Latin, got by the beggars from the Catholic prayers before the Reformation, and many, again, Italian got from the wandering musicians and others. Indeed, the showmen have but lately introduced a number of Italian phrases into their cant language. The Hindu Stani also contributes several words, and these have been introduced by the Lascar sailors, who come over here in the East Indiamen 
and lodge during their stay in the low tramps' lodging houses at the east end of London. Speaking of the learned tongues, I may mention that, precarious and abandoned as the vagabond's existence is, Many persons of classical or refined education have from time to time joined the ranks, occasionally from inclination, as in the popular instance of Bamfield Moore Carew, but generally through indiscretion and loss of character. Mayhew speaks of a low lodging house in which there were at one time five university men, three surgeons, and several sorts of broken-down clerks but old Harmon's saying that a wild rogue is he that is born a rogue will perhaps explain this seeming anomaly. But this will in some measure account for numerous classical and learned words figuring as cant terms in the vulgar dictionary. In the early part of the last century, when highwaymen were by all accounts so plentiful, a great many new words were added to the canting vocabulary whilst several old terms fell into disuse. Cant, for instance, as applied to thieves' talk, was supplanted by the word flash. In the north of England, the cant employed by tramps and thieves is known as the gammy. It is mainly from the old gypsy corrupted. In the large towns of Ireland and Scotland, this secret language is also spoken. All those words derived from the gammy are inserted in the dictionary as from the North Country. A singular feature, however, in vulgar language is the retention and the revival of sterling Old English words, long since laid up in ancient manuscripts, or the subject of dispute among learned antiquaries. Disraeli, somewhere, says, the purest source of neology is in the revival of old words. Words that wise Bacon or brave Raleigh spoke. Dr. Latham honours our subject by remarking that the thieves of London are the conservators of Anglo-Saxonisms. Mayhew, too, in his interesting work London Labour and the London Poor, admits that many cant and slang phrases are merely old English terms which have become obsolete through the caprices of fashion and the reader who looks into the dictionary of the vagabond's lingo will see at a glance that these gentlemen were quite correct, and that we are all compelled to acknowledge the singular truth that a great many old words, once respectable and in the mouths of kings and fine ladies, are now only so many signals for shrugs and shudders amongst exceedingly polite people. A young gentleman from Belgravia, who had lost his watch or his pocket handkerchief, would scarcely remark to his mamma that it had been boned, yet bone in old times meant amongst high and low to steal. And a young lady living in the precincts of dingy but aristocratic Mayfair, although enraptured with a Jenny Lind or a Ristori, would hardly think of turning back in the box to inform Papa that she, Ristori or Lind, made no bones of it. Yet the phrase was most respectable and well-to-do before it met with a change of circumstances. A crack article, however first-rate, would, as far as speech is concerned, have greatly displeased Dr. Johnson and Mr. Walker. Yet both crack, in the sense of excellent, and crack up, to boast or praise were not considered vulgarisms in the time of Henry VIII. Dodge, a cunning trick, is from the Anglo-Saxon, and ancient nobles used to get each other's dander up before appealing to their swords. Quite flabbergasting, also a respectable old word. The half-score of lookers-on with the thumps and cuts of their heavy weapons. Gallivanting, waiting upon the ladies, was as polite in expression as in action, whilst a clergyman at Paul's Cross thought nothing of bidding a noisy hearer hold his gab or shut up his gob. Gadding, roaming about in an idle and traipsing manner, was used in an old translation of the Bible, and to do anything gingerly was to do it with great care. Persons of modern tastes will be shocked to know that the great Lord Bacon spoke of the lower part of a man's face as his gills. Shakespeare, or as the French say, the divine William, also used many words which are now counted as dreadfully vulgar. Clean gone, in the sense of out of sight or entirely away. 
you took me all a mort, or confounded me. It won't fadge or suit, are phrases taken at random from the great dramatist's works. A London coster monger, or inhabitant of the streets, instead of saying, I'll make him yield, or give in, in a fight or contest, would say, I'll make him buckle under. Shakespeare, in his Henry the Fourth, Part Two, Act One, Scene One, has the word, and Mr. Halliwell, one of the greatest and most industrious of living antiquaries, informs us that the commentators do not supply another example. How strange, then, that the bard of Avon and the Cockney costermongers should be joint partners and sole proprietors of the vulgarism. If Shakespeare was not a pugilist, he certainly anticipated the terms of the prize ring, or they were respectable words before the prize ring was thought of, for he has pay, to beat or thrash, and pepper, with a similar meaning, also fancy, in the sense of pets and favourites. Pugilists are often termed the fancy. The cant word prig, from the Saxon prickan, to filch is also Shakespearean. So indeed is peace, a contemptuous term for a young woman. Shakespeare was not the only vulgar dramatist of his time. Ben Jonson, Beaumont and Fletcher, Broom and other playwriters occasionally put cant words into the mouths of their low characters or employed old words which have since degenerated into vulgarisms. Crusty, poor-tempered, two of a kidney, two of a sort, lark, a piece of fun, lug, to pull, bung, to give or pass, pickle, a sad plight, and to frump, to mock, are a few specimens casually picked from the works of the old histrionic writers. One old English mode of canting, simple and effective when familiarised by practice, was the inserting of a consonant between each syllable, thus taking G, how do you do would be how do you do. The name very properly given to this disagreeable nonsense, we are informed by Groves, was gibberish. Another cant has recently, a correspondent says before 1848, been attempted by transposing the initial letters of words so that a mutton chop becomes a cut and mop, a pint of stout, a steint of pout, but it is satisfactory to know that it has gained no ground. This is called marrow skiing, or medical Greek, from its use by medical students at the hospitals. Albert Smith terms it the Gower Street dialect. The language of Ziff, I may add, is another rude mode of disguising English, in use among the students at Winchester College. Some notices of this method of conveying secret information with an extensive glossary of the words, phrases, customs, etc., peculiar to the college, may be found in Mr. Mansfield's recently published School Life at Winchester College. Account of the Hieroglyphics Used by Vagabonds one of the most singular chapters in a history of vagabondism would certainly be an account of the hieroglyphic signs used by tramps and thieves. The reader may be startled to know that in addition to a sacred language, the wandering tribes of this country have private marks and symbolic signs with which to score their successes, failures and advice to succeeding beggars. In fact, that the country is really dotted over with beggars' finger posts and guide stones. The assertion, however strange it may appear, is no fiction. The subject was not long since brought under the attention of the government by Mr. Rawlinson in his report to the General Board of Health, Parish of Havant, Hampshire. There is, he says in his report, a sort of blackguard's literature and the initiated understand each other by slang or cant terms, by pantomimic signs, and by hieroglyphics. The vagrant's mark may be seen in Havant, on corners of streets, on doorposts, on house steps. Simple as these chalk lines appear, they inform the succeeding vagrants of all they require to know, 
and a few white scratches may say, be importunate or pass on. Another very curious account was taken from a provincial newspaper published in 1849 and forwarded to notes and queries under the head of mendicant Freemasonry. The writer remarked, Persons indiscreet enough to open their purses to the relief of the beggar tribe would do well to take a readily learned lesson as to the folly of that misguided benevolence which encourages and perpetuates vagabondism. Every door or passage is pregnant with instruction as to the error committed by the patron of beggars, as the beggar marks show that a system of Freemasonry is followed by which a beggar knows whether it would be worth his while to call into a passage or knock at a door. Let anyone examine the entrances to the passages in any town, and there he will find chalk marks, unintelligible to him but significant enough to beggars. If a thousand towns are examined, the same marks will be found at every passage entrance. The passage mark is a cipher with a twisted tail. In some cases, the tail projects into the passage, in others outwardly, thus seeming to indicate whether the houses down the passage are worth calling at or not. Almost every door has its marks. These are varied. In some cases there is a cross on the brickwork, in others a cipher. The figures one, two, three are also used. Every person may for himself test the accuracy of these statements by the examination of the brickwork near his own doorway, thus demonstrating that mendicity is a regular trade, carried out upon a system calculated to save time and realize the largest profits. These remarks refer mainly to provincial towns, London being looked upon as the tramp's home, and therefore too fly or experienced to be duped by such means. The only other notice of the hieroglyphics of vagabonds that I have met with is in Mayhew's London Labour and the London Poor. Mayhew obtained his information from two tramps, who stated that hawkers employ these signs as well as beggars. One tramp thus described the method of working a small town. Two hawkers, or pals, go together, but separate when they enter a village, one taking one side of the road and selling different things, and so as to inform each other as to the character of the people at whose houses they call, they chalk certain marks on their doorposts. Another informant stated that, if a patterer has been crabbed, that is, offended, at any of the cribs, houses, he mostly chalks a signal at or near the door. Another use is also made of these hieroglyphics. Charts of successful begging neighborhoods are rudely drawn and symbolical signs attached to each house to show whether benevolent or adverse. In many cases, there is over the kitchen mantelpiece of a tramp's lodging house a map of the district dotted here and there with memorandums of failure or success. A correct facsimile of one of these singular maps has been placed as a frontispiece. It was obtained from the patterers and tramps who supplied a great many words for this work, and who have been employed by me for some time in collecting old ballads, Christmas carols, dying speeches, and last lamentations as materials for a history of popular literature. The reader will no doubt be amused with the drawing. The locality depicted is near Maidstone in Kent, and I am informed that it was probably sketched by a wandering screever in payment for a night's lodging. The English practice of marking everything and scratching names on public property extends itself to the tribe of vagabonds. On the map, as may be seen in the left-hand corner, some traveller has drawn a favourite or noted female singularly nicknamed Three-Quarter Sarah. What were the peculiar accomplishments of this lady to demand so uncommon a name? The reader will be at a loss to discover. But a patterer says it probably refers to a shuffling dance of that name, common in tramps' lodging houses, and in which Three-Quarter Sarah may have been a proficient. Above her, three beggars or hawkers have reckoned their day's earnings amounting to thirteen shillings, 
and on the right a tolerably correct sketch of a low hawker or costermonger is drawn. To Dover, the nigh way, is the exact phraseology, and up here, a fair specimen of the self-acquired education of the tribe of Cadgers. No key or explanation to the hieroglyphics was given in the original, because it would have been superfluous, when every inmate of the lodging house knew the marks from their cradle, or rather their mother's back. Should there be no map in most lodging houses, there's an old man who is a guide to every walk in the vicinity, and who can tell on every round each house that is good for a cold tater. The hieroglyphics that are used are an X for no good, too poor, and no too much. What looks like a question mark on its side with a line through the end means stop. If you don't have what they want, they will buy. They are pretty fly or knowing. What looks like the letter Y on its side or a tuning fork is go in this direction. It is better than the other road. Nothing that way. A diamond shape means bonny, good, safe for a cold tater, if for nothing else. Cheese your patter, don't talk much here. A triangle pointed down is coopered, spoilt, by too many tramps calling there. A square is gammy, unfavorable, like to have you taken up. Mind the dog. A circle with a point in it is flummoxed, dangerous, sure of a month in quad, in prison. And a circle with a cross in it is religious, but tidy on the whole. Where did these signs come from and when were they first used are questions which I have asked myself again and again whilst endeavouring to discover their history. Knowing the character of the gypsies, and ascertaining from a tramp that they are well acquainted with the hieroglyphics, and have been as long ago as ever he could remember, I have little hesitation in ascribing the invention to them. And strange it would be if some modern Belzoni or Champollion discovered in these beggars' marks fragments of ancient Egyptian or Hindu hieroglyphic writing. But this, of course, is a simple vagary of the imagination. That the gypsies were in the habit of leaving memorials of the road they had taken and the successes that had befallen them, there can be no doubt. In an old book, The Triumph of Wit, from 1724, there's a passage which appears to have been copied from some older work, and it runs thus. The gypsies set out twice a year and scatter all over England, each parcel having their appointed stages that they may not interfere nor hinder each other. And for that purpose, when they set forward in the country, they stick up boughs in the way of diverse kinds, according as it is agreed among them that one company may know which way another is gone, and so take another road. The works of Hoyland and Borrow supply other instances. I cannot close this subject without drawing attention to the extraordinary fact that actually on the threshold of the gibbet, the sign of the vagabond is to be met with. The murderer's signal is even exhibited from the gallows, says Mr. Rawlinson's report to the General Board of Health, as a red handkerchief held in the hand of the felon about to be executed is a token that he dies without having betrayed any professional secrets. Since the first edition of this work was published, the author has received from various parts of England numerous evidences of the still active use of beggar's marks and mendicant hieroglyphics. One gentleman writes from Great Yarmouth to say that only a short time since, whilst residing in Norwich, he used to frequently see them on the houses and street corners in the suburbs. From another gentleman, a clergyman, I learn that he has so far made himself acquainted with the meanings of the signs employed, that by himself marking the characters of a square, gammy, and a circle with a point in it, flummoxed, on the gateposts of his parsonage, he enjoys a singular immunity from alms, seekers, and cadgers on a tramp. In a popular constable's guide, giving the practice of justices in petty sessions, I have recently met with the following interesting paragraph 
corroborating what has just been said on the hieroglyphics used by vagabonds. Snowden's magistrate's assistant from 1852 states, Gypsies follow their brethren by numerous marks, such as strewing handfuls of grass in the daytime at a four-lane or crossroads, the grass being strewn down the road the gang have taken, also by a cross being made on the ground with a stick or knife. The longest end of the cross denotes the route taken. In the night time, a cleft stick is placed in the fence at the crossroads, with an arm pointing down the road their comrades have taken. The marks are always placed on the left-hand side, so that the stragglers can easily and readily find them. From the cleft stick here alluded to, we learn the origin and use of what looks like the Y on its side, the third hieroglyphic in the vagabond's private list. A short history of slang, or the vulgar language of fast life. All ridiculous words make their first entry into a language by familiar phrases. I dare not answer for these, that they will not in time be looked upon as a part of our tongue. Addison's Spectator Slang is the language of street humour, of fast, high and low life. Kant, as was stated in the chapter on that subject, is the vulgar language of secrecy. They are both universal and ancient, and appear to have been the peculiar concomitants of gay, vulgar, or worthless persons in every part of the world at every period of time. Indeed, if we are to believe implicitly the saying of the wise man, that there is nothing new under the sun, the fast men of buried Nineveh, with their knotty and doormatty looking beards, may have cracked slang jokes on the steps of Sennacherib's palace, and stocks and stones of ancient Egypt, and the bricks of venerable and used up Babylon, may, for aught we know, be covered with slang hieroglyphics, unknown to modern antiquaries, which have long been stumbling blocks to the philologist. So impossible is it at this day to say what was then authorised, or what vulgar language. Slang is as old as speech, and the congregating together of people in cities. It is the result of crowding and excitement and artificial life. Even to the classics it was not unknown, as witness the pages of Aristophanes and Plautus, Terence and Athenaeus. Martial, the epigrammatist, is full of slang. When an uninvited guest accompanied his friend, the slang of the day styled him his umbra. When a man was trussed neck and heels, it called him jocosely quadrupus. Old English slang was coarser and depended more upon downright vulgarity than our modern slang. It was a jesting speech or humorous indulgence for the thoughtless moment, or the drunken hour, and it acted as a vent peg for a fit of temper or irritability. But it did not interlard and permeate every description of conversation as now. It was confined to nicknames and improper subjects, and encroached but to a very small extent upon the domain of authorised speech. Indeed, it was exceedingly limited when compared with the vast territory of slang in such general favour and complete circulation at the present day. Still, although not an alarming encumbrance, as in our time, slang certainly did exist in this country centuries ago, as we may see if we look down the page of any respectable history of England. Cromwell was familiarly called Old Knoll just the same as Bonaparte was termed Boney, and Wellington Conky, or Nosy, only a few years ago. His legislature, too, was spoken of in a high-favoured way as the Bear Bones, or Rump Parliament, and his followers were nicknamed Roundheads, and the peculiar religious sects of his protectorate were styled Puritans and Quakers. This term, with a singular literal downrightness, which would be remarkable in any other people than the French, is translated by them as the sect of Trembleur. The Civil War pamphlets and the satirical hits of the Cavaliers and the Commonwealth men originated numerous slang words and vulgar similes in full use at the present moment. 
Here is a field of inquiry for the philological society. Indeed, I may say a territory, for there are thirty thousand of these partisan tracts. Later still, in the court of Charles the Second, the naughty ladies and the gay lords, with the Rochester at their head, talked slang, and very naughty slang it was too. Fops in those days, when over head and ears in debt, and in continual fear of arrest, termed their enemies, the bailiffs, Philistines or Moabites. Swift alludes to Philistines in his Art of Polite Conversation in 1738. At a later period, when collars were worn detached from shirts, in order to save the expense of washing, an object it would seem with needy swells in all ages, they obtained the name of Jacobites. One half of the coarse wit in Butler's Hudibras lurks in the vulgar words and phrases which he was so fond of employing. They were more homely and forcible than the mild and elegant sentences of Cowley, and the people therefore hurrahed them and pronounced Butler one of themselves, or, as we should say in a joyful moment, a jolly good fellow. Orator Henley preached and prayed in slang, and first charmed and then swayed the dirty mobs in Lincoln's Inn Fields by vulgarisms. Burley Groves mentions Henley with the remark that we owe a great many slang phrases to him. Swift and old Sir Roger Lestrange and R. Buthnot were all fond of vulgar or slang language. Indeed, we may see from a slang word used by the latter how curious is the gradual adoption of vulgar terms in our standard dictionaries. The worthy doctor, in order to annihilate, or as we should say, with a fitting respect to the subject under consideration, smash an opponent, thought proper on an occasion to use the word cabbage, not in the ancient and esculentary sense of a flatulent vegetable of the kitchen garden, but in the at once slang sense of purloining or cribbing. Johnson soon met with the word, looked at it, examined it, weighed it, and shook his head, but out of respect to a brother doctor, inserted it in his dictionary, labelling it, however, prominently cant, whilst Walker and Webster years after, when to cabbage was to pilfer all over England, placed the term in their dictionaries as an ancient and very respectable word. Another slang term, gull, to cheat or delude, sometimes varied to gully, is stated to be connected with the Dean of St. Patrick's. Gull, a dupe or a fool, is often used by our old dramatists, and is generally believed to have given rise to the verb. But a curious little edition of Bamfield Moore Carew, published in 1827, says that to gull or gully is derived from the well-known Gulliver, the hero of the famous travels. How crammed with slang are the dramatic works of the last century. The writers of the comedies and farces in those days must have lived in the streets and written their plays in the public houses, so filled are they with vulgarisms and unauthorized words. The popular phrases, I owe you one, that's one for his knob, and keep moving, dad, arose in this way. The second of these sayings was doubtless taken from the card table, for at cribbage the player who holds the knave of the suit turned up counts one for his knob, and the dealer who turns up a knave counts two for his heels. In Mrs. St. Liver's admirable comedy of A Bold Stroke for a Wife, we see the origin of that popular street phrase, the real Simon Pure. Simon Pure is the Quaker name adopted by Colonel Fainwell as a trick to obtain a hand of Mistress Anne Lovely in marriage. The veritable Quaker, the real Simon Pure, recommended by Aminadab Holdfast of Bristol as a fit sojourner with Obadiah Prim, arrives at last to the discomfiture of the Colonel who, to maintain his position and gain time, concocts a letter in which the real Quaker is spoken of as a housebreaker who had travelled in the leather conveniency from Bristol and adopted the garb and name of the Western Quaker in order to pass off as the real Simon Pure, but only for the purpose of robbing the house 
and cutting the throat of the perplexed Obadiah. The scene in which the two Simon Pures, the real and the counterfeit, meet is one of the best in the comedy. Tom Brown, of facetious memory, as his friends were wont to say, and Ned Ward, who wrote humorous books, and when tired drew beer for his customers at his alehouse in Long Acre, were both great producers of slang in the last century, and to them we owe many popular current phrases and household words. Written slang was checked rather than advanced by the pens of Addison, Johnson, and Goldsmith, although John B., the bottle holder and historiographer of the pugilistic band of brothers, in the youthful days of flat nosed Tom Cribb, has gravely stated that Johnson, when young and rakish, contributed to an early volume of The Gentleman's Magazine a few pages, by way of specimen, of a slang dictionary. The result, Mr. B. says, of his midnight ramblings. And Goldsmith, I must not forget to remark, certainly coined a few words, although as a rule his pen was pure and graceful, and adverse to neologisms. The word fudge, it has been stated, was first used by him in literary composition. This is incorrect. See fudge in the dictionary. It originated with one Captain Fudge, a notorious fibber, nearly a century before. Street phrases, nicknames, and vulgar words were continually being added to the great stock of popular slang up to the commencement of the present century, when it received numerous additions from pugilism, horse racing, and fast life generally, which suddenly came into great public favour and was at its height when the Prince Regent was in his rakish minority. Slang in those days was generally termed flash language. So popular was it with the bloods of high life that it constituted the best paying literary capital for certain authors and dramatists. Pierce Egan issued Boxiana and Life in London, six portly octavo volumes crammed with slang and Moncrief wrote the most popular farce of the day, Tom and Jerry, adapted from the latter work, which, to use newspaper slang, took the town by storm, and with its then fashionable vulgarisms made the fortune of the old Adelphi Theatre, and was without exception the most wonderful instance of a continuous theatrical run in ancient or modern times. This also was brimful of slang. Other authors helped to popularise and extend slang down to our own time, when it has taken a somewhat different turn, dropping many of the cant and old vulgar words, and assuming a certain quaint and fashionable phraseology. Frenchy, familiar, utilitarian, and jovial. There can be no doubt but that common speech is greatly influenced by fashion, fresh manners, and that general change of ideas which steals over a people once in a generation. But before I proceed further into the region of slang, it will be well to say something on the etymology of the word. The word slang is only mentioned by two lexicographers, Webster and Ogilvy. Johnson, Walker, and the older compilers of dictionaries gave slang the preterite of sling, but not a word about slang in the sense of low, vulgar, or unrecognized language. The origin of the word has often been asked for in literary journals and books, but only one man, as far as I can learn, has ever hazarded an etymology, Jonathan B., the vulgar chronicler of the prize ring. With a recklessness peculiar to pugilism, B stated that slang was derived from the slangs or fetters worn by prisoners, having acquired that name from the manner in which they were worn, as they required a sling of string to keep them off the ground. B had just been nettled at Pierce Egham, producing a new edition of Gross's Dictionary of the Vulgar Tongue and was determined to excel him in a vulgar dictionary of his own, which should be more racy, more pugilistic, and more original. How far he succeeded in this latter particular, his ridiculous etymology of slang will show. Slang is not an English word. 
It is the gypsy term for their secret language, and its synonym is gibberish, another word which was believed to have had no distinct origin. Groves, stout and burly Captain Groves, whom we may characterize as the greatest antiquary, joker and porter drinker of his day, was the first lexicographer to recognize the word slang. It occurs in his Classical Dictionary of the Vulgar Tongue of 1785, with the signification that it implies cant or vulgar language. Groves, I may remark in passing, was a great favorite with the poet Burns, and so pleased him by his extensive powers of storytelling and grog imbibing that the companionable and humor-loving Scotch bard wrote for his fat friend, or to use his own words, the fine, fat, fodgel white, the immortal poem of Tam O'Shanter. Without troubling the reader with a long account of the transformation into an English term of the word slang, I may remark in passing that it is easily seen how we obtained it from the gypsies, hucksters and beggars on tramp, or at fairs and races, associate and frequently join in any rough enterprise with the gypsies. See what the druid says in Silk and Scarlet, Post and Paddock, and his other sporting works about the card sellers, booth men, horse holders, cockshy men, and other well-known frequenters of race courses. The word would be continually heard by them, and would in this manner soon become cant. The word slang assumed various meanings amongst costermongers, beggars, and vagabonds of all orders. It was, and is still, used to express cheating by false weights, a rare show, retiring by a back door, a watch chain, their secret language, etc. When carried by fast or vulgar fashionables from the society of thieves and low characters to their own drawing rooms, it would as quickly become slang and the representative term for all vulgar or slang language. Any sudden excitement, peculiar circumstance, or popular literary production is quite sufficient to originate and set a-going a score of slang words. Nearly every election or public agitation throws out offshoots of the excitement or scintillations of the humour in the shape of slang terms. Vulgar at first, but at length adopted as semi-respectable from the force of habit and custom. There's scarcely a condition or calling in life that does not possess its own peculiar slang. The professions, legal and medical, have each familiar and unauthorized terms for peculiar circumstances and things, and I'm quite certain that the clerical calling, or the cloth, is not entirely free from this peculiarity. Every workshop, warehouse, factory and mill throughout the country has its slang and so have the public schools of Eton, Harrow, and Westminster, and the great universities of Oxford and Cambridge. Sea slang constitutes the principal charm of a sailor's yarn, and our soldiers and officers have each their peculiar nicknames and terms for things and subjects proper and improper. A writer in Household Words, number 183, has gone so far as to remark that a person shall not read one single parliamentary debate, as reported in a first-class newspaper, without meeting scores of slang words, and that from Mr. Speaker in his chair to the cabinet ministers whispering behind it, from mover to seconder, from true blue protectionist to extremist radical, Mr. Barry's new house echoes and re-echoes with slang. Really, it seems as if our boasted English tongue were a very paltry and ill-provided contrivance after all. Or can it be that we are the most vulgar of people? The universality of slang is extraordinary. Let any person for a short time narrowly examine the conversation of their dearest and nearest friends, say. Censor, like, even slice and analyze their own supposed correct talk, and they shall be amazed at the numerous unauthorized, and what we can only call vulgar, words they continually employ. It is not the number of new words that we are ever introducing that is so reprehensible. 
There is not so much harm in this practice, frequently termed in books the license of expression, if neologisms are really required, but it is the continually encumbering of old words with fresh and strange meanings. Look at those simple and useful verbs do, cut, go, and take, and see how they are hampered and overloaded. And then let us ask ourselves, how is it possible for a French or German gentleman, be he ever so well educated, to avoid continually blundering and floundering amongst our little words? when trying to make himself understood in an ordinary conversation. He may have studied our language the required time, and have gone through the usual amount of grinding, and practised the common allotment of patience, but all to no purpose as far as accuracy is concerned. I am aware that most new words are generally regarded as slang, although afterwards they may become useful and respectable additions to our standard dictionaries. Jabber and hoax were slang and cant terms in Swift's time. So indeed were mob and sham. North, in his examen, says, I may note that the rabble first changed their title and were called the mob in the assemblies of this Green Ribbon Club. It was their beast of burden and called first mobile vulgus, but fell naturally into the construction of one syllable and ever since is become proper English. In the same work, the disgraceful origin of sham is given. Words directly from the Latin and Greek, and Carlylisms, are allowed by an indulgent public to pass and take their places in books. Sound contributes many slang words, a source that etymologists too frequently overlook. Nothing pleases an ignorant person so much as a high-sounding term full of fury. How melodious and drum-like are those vulgar coruscations rumbumptious, slanting dicular, splendiferous, rumbustious, and ferrica dowser. What a pull the sharp-nosed lodging housekeeper thinks she has over her victims if she can but hurl such testimonies of a liberal education at them when they are disputing her charges and threatening to absquatulate. In the United States, the vulgar genteel even excel the poor, stuck-up cockneys in their formation of a native fashionable language. How charming to a refined ear are abskies, Catawampusly, exflunctify, obscute, kesloche, kesus, keswallop, and kewallox. Vulgar words representing action and brisk movement often owe their origin to sound. Mispronunciation, too, is another great source of vulgar or slang words. Ramshackle, shackly, nary one, for neither or neither one. Otomy or atomy for anatomy, wrench for rinse, are specimens. The commonalty dislike frequently occurring words difficult of pronunciation, and so we have the street abridgments of bime by for by and by, cause for because, gin for given, handkerchief for handkerchief, rheumatiz for rheumatism, backy for tobacco and many others, not perhaps slang, but certainly all vulgarisms. Archbishop Waitley, in his interesting Remains of Bishop Copleston, has inserted a leaf from the bishop's notebook on the popular corruption of names, mentioning, among others, kickshaws, as from the French quelquechaux, beefeater, the lubberly guardian of royalty in a procession, and the supposed devourer of enormous beefsteaks, as but a vulgar pronunciation of the French bouffetier, and George and Cannon, the sign of a public house, as nothing but a corruption, although so soon, of the popular premier of the last generation, George Canning. Literature has its slang terms. The desire on the part of writers to say funny and startling things in a novel and curious way, the late household words, for instance, contributes many unauthorized words to the great stock of slang.